All right, and we are live. I um, want to thank everybody for, uh, for listening in today. Uh, we have, looks like we have a lot of um, viewers from the past webinars and some new viewers as well. So for all the new viewers, just gonna do a quick intro and then we're gonna get to uh, uh, Conrad and Dr. Ross. Uh, my name is uh, Ari Zuckerman, Vice President at Center Court Sports Academy. For all the new listeners, our main goal in these webinars is um, to keep valuable information flowing to the tennis and to the local community. Uh, we also want to keep everybody engaged with creative ideas throughout the, um, the current challenging situation that we're all going through. Um, joining us today, uh, two special guests, Dr. Anthony Ross, former Pepperdine All-American, Wimbledon competitor, and now is a um, tennis-specific psychologist. Um, over the past 15 years, Dr. Ross has consulted to players of all standards and ages, including world junior number ones, national high school and NCAA um, champions, coaches, ATP, WTA tour title champs, players who competed against Roger, Rafa, Serena, Novak. Um, and currently he consults to the uh, Tennis Australia Canberra, probably pronounced that wrong, association, as well as North Carolina Men's Tennis, Soto Tennis Academy in Spain, and the PJ Tennis Academy in Thailand. Um, also joining us, everybody uh, probably uh, knows Conrad. Um, Conrad is the uh, COO and Director of Coaching and High Performance at Center Courts uh, Sports Academy. Um, in this webinar, Anthony is going to introduce to us the packed mental toughness method, uh, which he has used to reliably reliably help players win 20 to 100% more matches within six months. He will review the four keys to understanding and improving mental fitness. Uh, with a special focus on um, training off the court, which is obviously very important uh, in these days. He will also introduce our center court 28 day mental, hold on, let me get this right. You could probably explain that one. The, the 28 day, uh, I'll have Anthony and uh, could take it over from here though. Um, so Anthony, the floor is yours. Um, we're excited. Thank you, Ari. All right, did you? I might just jump in there real fast. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to have you, mate. And uh, again, I have to apologize to everyone for our Aussie accents uh, <laughs> that we come across, no doubt. But um, before we get into it and we really kind of let you go through, um, you know, a fantastic program. We've been talking about it for some time. Um, obviously, we're in a very difficult moment right now with people limited in what they can do on an actual tennis court. Um, however, that presents us with this incredible opportunity to develop in these areas that we call the intangibles. Alert from that um, I think it's absolutely critical that um, everyone really pays attention to the details, the activities, um, the tasks, and the takeaway um, things they can do at home. I know that there's also going to be some um, possibility for parents to be involved and helping their children um, with improving in their mental skills. Um, so without you know any further ado, we really look forward to having you and we're really keen to understand this massive area of mental toughness, um, which you know I was saying the other day in our introductory webinar, a lot of people aren't quite sure what it means. It's just a seems to be a term that's bantied around, you know, are you mentally tough? You're not mentally tough. So I want to ask you first, what is mental toughness? How can we, you know, categorize a player's skill set in that way? And what is it that you look for? What are the key, you know, simple things before you get into your presentation? Yeah, great question. And it's a key question, isn't it? And that's, that was literally one of the first slides in the presentation. So for me, mental toughness or mental fitness is how well we take our physical, technical, tactical skills and apply them during matches specifically, and but also practice, also practice. How well do we actually uh, work during practice and work to improve? And so that's the thing. We spend so much time typically on the physical, our physical fitness, the technical skills, obviously, tactical skills. I know you had Craig on the other day, um, and they're all super, super important, but then, mental mental toughness is you know if we think of these four categories and which i really do i really think we could categorize the importance as 25 percent each the key here is that each of these areas rely on each other and so i could be incredibly physically fit but if i don't have 
mental toughness, I will get into a match and then not take those physical skills, not take my technical skills and actually be able to use them effectively, apply them and, and win basically. And so, so in terms of our matches, it's for me, mental toughness, all I'm thinking about is going, okay, how well does a player go and take the skills that they work so hard to develop and apply them effectively in, in matches? And in terms of the things we look for in, in going, okay, that player is mental, mentally tough, as I said, we, that's a general way of looking, going, it's my sense of how well they apply the skills that I see in terms of the physical and technical skills. More specifically, I did my uh, PhD with Tennis Australia several years ago, uh, and we ended up coming up with a, like several categories uh, and important moments, basically. And so for me, off the top of my head, a few keys here are uh, how well can a player consistently rock up and compete uh, point by point? How well can players finish matches? Uh, how well can players respond after they've lost the, the first set? Um, generally speaking, um, yeah, how well do players start matches? How, how well do players compete during tough situations, uh, whether it's windy or their opponents playing well? Um, so all these factors we can look at and go specifically when you're, if you're online and you're, and you're uh, thinking about, am I mentally tough? You would just look at the different situations um, and challenges that we face in matches and then think about, well, how well do I do in those situations? Very good, great answer. Um... I guess if we can, let's get straight into it. There's a lot of information that um, we're all really keen to, to hear. Yeah, awesome. So I might just bring up the slideshow and I'll uh, I'll get stuck into it. I should be able to. Yeah, do you want me to set the slideshow for you? I think I'm good. Okay, there we go. can we see that? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yep, yeah, so as, okay, awesome. So I'll get stuck into it. So as the guy said, uh, we're really looking in this one, how do we improve our responses to challenges like I was just talking about? But I think specifically, in, given the times, right, we're having, having these challenges, these general challenges. The key here is what I'll talk about today is absolutely relevant to uh, how we reply and take, make the best of difficult situations generally at the moment with the, uh, with the virus. So I think we've covered this. I think the, the one other thing I'd mention around myself, and I think it's, it's uh, relevant for the current times, uh, and when I think of mental toughness more generally, Conrad, in answering that question, it's also it's just generally how how well uh, how well do we make the best of the cards that we're dealt? I guess in and this applies to general life as well. And and for myself, one massive challenge I had over the last several years. Luckily, I've been great for about eighteen months. But I had a what Stanford. Uh, researchers are calling the metabolic trap it's a massive metabolic failure in your system where you, your body stops uh, uh, stops metabolizing food and it has sort of catastrophic effects in your body and so at one point in talking about lockdown i was in bed for 1.500 days in a row unable to sit up or even get in a wheelchair yeah. um, and unable to speak so my diaphragm basically became i got a mu muscle atrophy where I, my, my diaphragm lost the ability to <laughs> to be able to speak. So, um, and, and so during that time, like that was obviously an extreme version of, of, of being in lockdown. But the key here for what I talk about today and the PAC method, it was, and my experiences in tennis, I would say was an incredible advantage for me to get through that period mentally uh, because I applied the stuff that I'll be talking about today as well and i think it is it is very relevant for some of the concerns the worries the frustrations that we'll all be facing uh during this time so we've covered uh, what is mental toughness and its importance um and so as i go through this this is a really uh good question so if you're a player think about yourself if you're a parent thinking about think about uh when you were uh watching your child but think about a recent match obviously we probably haven't been on court now for a little while but if you can think back in a recent match, and this is this is a relevant thing to think about when it comes to mental toughness, is a match when you came off and you thought, I could have won that if I competed more effectively, if I applied my physical skills more effectively. And what, try to think about from your perspective, what was it that stopped you from competing effectively in that match? Or if you're a parent, you think you might think about your child and think, when I was watching, what was it that I think stopped my child um, from competing effectively? So let's just take 30 seconds on that one. 
Do you want them to write their answers in the yeah, chat, they, Anthony, or just think about it? They, they can think about it if they want to write it down, and that's fine. We won't be going into the the back and forth at the moment. It's more a question I want you to reflect on as we go through the elements of mental toughness. And the extension to that question is just generally when I am losing, when I'm coming off from matches or when I'm talking to my coaches and they are saying, you know what, you could have won that if you were more mentally tough. What causes have your coaches talked about or what have you thought, okay, this is the thing that, that stopped me. So 20 seconds and then we'll, we'll get stuck into moving forward. Man, you're uh, you're uh, definitely engaging them. There's a ton of questions, so we'll save uh, we'll save them to the end. But uh, but you're definitely uh, you're definitely inciting some uh, some interesting questions here. Okay, so to start, let's uh, have a look at what Novak says about the importance of what he believes the importance of mental uh, fitness training is to him. And svojih misli, emocija koje mogu da dovedu čovjeka u ludila i to je u mogu slučaju naravno kao tenisera i ja sam deo individualnog sporta i onda ja nemam alternativu kada sam u terenu, ne mogu da tražim zamenu i onda ja verujem izuzetno u pripremu disciplina je deo pripreme Disciplina je jedna, da kažemo, karakteristika koja je izuzetno važna za svakoga, pogotovo sportiste, ali priprema, da kažemo, kao jedna oblast, obuhvata mnogo stvari i zato ja nekako uvijek sam bio privržen holističkom, celovitom pristupu životu i mojoj karijeri. To je jako bitno zato što, pogotovo kao individualni sportista, Ja ako hoću da se takmećem na najvišem nivou i da stremim ka najvišim ciljevima, ja ne mogu da dozvolim da uđem u neku kompromitarnu situaciju gde ne mogu da izađem iz nje brzo. Znači meni se u svakom meču desi da ja imam padovi, iako to možda nije vidljivo za nekoga ko gleda. Svaki meč se desi, pred svaki meč da imam tremu. Naučiš kako da se nosiš sa tim i naučiš kako da... kanališeš, ne da kontroliš, da je potreban trening. Koliko god kao jedan sportista moraš da provedeš vremena na teniskom trenu, u ovom slučaju ili u teretani ili gde god, bavljanja fizičke spreme da se dovedeš u stanje da možeš da se takmičeš na određenu i ovo toliko po meni, ako ne i više moraš da provedeš vremena, radeći na sebi i na svojim prednostima i manama i pogotovo manama da bi izbjegao momente u meču koji mogu da se desi i koji će se desiti, ali da te oni, ne da izbegneš te momente, nego da izbegneš da ostaneš zarobljen u tim momentima. Ok. Ok, we'll bring the slideshow back up. And so that is super important. I'm sure Craig talked about Novak and working with Novak quite a bit the other day. And it's very important, I think, to think about from Novak, he's a guy to listen to because he he now, I would say, is one of the best mental competitors of all time, the mentally fit, fittest players of all time. But he didn't start that way. When he was a younger player, he had all sorts of difficulties, which I'll mention as we go um, throughout the presentation. Um, but when he's talking about it's as important as physical training, it's something to be taken very, very seriously because he's, he's worked very hard to uh, improve his skills in this area. Okay. And so the way to get the hang of what components go into being mentally fit, this is very important. And when I ask that question of what stops you being mentally fit, at the end of the day, if I was to talk to you individually, there really are four key areas that we want to look at. And the way I love to help us get the hang of this is through an analogy or a story about a bus driver. It's a little weird to start with, but it's a very, very good way for us to get the hang of all these four components that can help us understand when we are not competing as well as we want, what actually is going on. And so the idea here is if we think about what does a bus driver need to do to drive their bus well and be, do a, be uh, successful in what they do. And so the first thing here is that the bus driver obviously needs to know where he or she is driving. And the second component here is why is it important for them to drive a certain way and, and what's important to them about doing their job the more they're connected with the importance of what they're doing, 
and where they need to go, the better they'll do. And so that's the first part. I call this purpose. Oh, I'm going to stay on this on this the uh, image here. The second thing is that the bus driver needs to aim and maintain their attention in an appropriate place. So they need to pay attention to the road, right? They they need to, but perhaps pay attention to what they're doing in the in the bus as well. So the second part here is to be able to control their attention into in the present moment very well. The third thing they need to be able to do is the obvious stuff. They obviously need to be able to steer, brake, and and so forth, and respond to the 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 lights, for example. Um, so it's the actions. They need to commit to the helpful actions that actually help them drive the bus. And then the fourth thing here, which is a super important one, is the bus driver obviously picks up passengers along the way. Sometimes good passengers come on, sit quietly, thank them for the ride. Sometimes more difficult passengers come on the bus. And in this story, the, the difficult passengers tend to make it more difficult to drive well. And so, you know, the difficult passengers might start to sort of sledge the driver and say, you know, you, you suck, you should be driving better, you should be doing a better job. Uh, and or they might try to get the driver to go the wrong way. So the driver needs to go straight to get to the destination. But the difficult passengers in the back of the bus might be saying, like, you got to turn right, you got to turn right. And so to to the keys here to at, for the bus driver in this fourth component is really about responding well to the difficult passengers. The bus driver's got to uh, basically be able to respond well to the difficult passengers. And there's two parts to this. The first one is the bus driver will tend to automatically listen to the passengers and 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 drive based on what they're saying. But the skill they need to develop is to have choice in how they respond to the difficult passengers. They need to be able to notice when the passenger is saying saying difficult stuff, I don't want to listen to them. I want to re focus on the road, commit to where I've got to go and commit to the actions. The second difficult thing in responding to the difficult passengers is that the bus driver obviously gets sick of the difficult passengers and wants to get rid of them. And so without realising, the bus driver not, might not might get back in the back of the bus and try to get rid of them. But unfortunately, the bus will crash if that happens. And so the, the second part, as well as having this awareness and choice in how they respond to the difficult passengers, they also want to be able to uh, stay in the front of the bus and just keep paying attention to, to the road Commit to the helpful actions, even while the bus drive, even while the passengers are making it more difficult. And so, if we think about the bus story as it is relevant for us in tennis, here's the four the four things: is we want to think of ourselves as players as the bus driver, okay? And the four components that we need to be mentally fit are these four that we see on the screen here. So when we are playing tennis, before we go out on the court, before we hit the court, we need to know what is it, where are we trying to head? What are we each aiming to achieve? And why is it important for us to achieve these things? But also more than that, why is it important for us to act in certain ways? What are our values? And the more we can connect with our purpose as tennis players, the more motivated we'll be to commit to helpful actions as we go along the way. Um, and then we've got attentional control. Okay, so this is our ability to aim and maintain our attention in helpful places. Third, we've got committed actions. So these are the processes. So when you're talking to your coaches, you, they'll be talking about the processes that can help you improve. The processes like a game style, for example, a strategy that, and what, what I talked about last time, the strategies are going to help you. If you can commit to this strategy, it's going to increase the chance of success. So it's what are the actions we're committing to. And then finally, Actually, I'll ask this question before we go on. Just in the chat, reply, what do you think from the bus story, what do you think the passengers on the bus might represent to us when we are playing tennis? What do the passengers in the bus mean? So let's see if we get some, uh, some replies there. Give us your ideas on what am I talking about when I'm talking about the passengers on the bus if we're thinking about us as tennis players. Any ideas? Game. Okay, games you win or lose, thoughts in your head. So we've got a winner already. Huh. 
Yes, crowds. Okay, so commonly uh, players answer this question by saying it might be the external stuff, like the distractions and so forth, or the opponents and stuff. Thoughts while playing. Yes. So the answer to this question is is the passengers on the bus represent our unintentional thoughts and feelings that show up as we compete. And so they're like the fear and the frustration that we feel, right, and and so forth. I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along. Um, so, but yes, the passengers on the bus are the, the, the difficult thoughts and feelings that might be saying things like, you suck, you should be doing better, better, that's frustration. Sometimes we name the passengers, like Freddie frustration tends to say, that's not fair, you should be doing better. Any anxious might be saying you've got to win or you're going to lose or just make it when it's a tight situation. And so we get these unintentional thoughts and feelings sharp as we compete. So now I'll just talk through these and I'll list it a little bit more detail. And so the first one is purpose. And that's our pack method. It's a great way to remember these four keys in terms of P-A-C-T. We're sort of making the pack to pay attention to these four key, key skills. Um, so with purpose, it's really made up of our gut, our goals and our values. As I said, the goals is we're thinking about what do we want to achieve? It's really important to connect with what is what is the purpose? What is What are we trying to achieve? Usually it's going to be about winning, improving our skills and so forth. And then we're talking also about why is this important to me? The more, one simple thing you can do uh, when you do get the chance to go on court is just spend a minute before you start your session by connecting with what's the purpose of this session? What's the purpose of this match? Um, and why is it important for me? Even when we play matches, especially as a junior player, connecting with uh, the idea of, of improving your skills during matches is a very important thing, perhaps even more important than winning uh, as a junior because we want to be able to finish matches saying, you know what, I'm a better player at the end of this match because of the way that I work to improve my skills be, uh, as I play. Um, now, in the current circumstances, being able to connect with your purpose of why would you do stuff when you can't get on court? Why would you do your physical training? Why would you do your tactical um, reviews? Why would you be doing your mental fitness uh, practice? It's a very important thing to connect with your purpose because it's, it's the thing that really motivates us. The second key here, attentional control. And so attentional control is made up of three parts. It's our ability to put our attention on a target and aim and maintain it as long as possible. So that's the first part. The more, the longer we can aim and maintain and concentrate on a certain thing, the, the, the better. But then the second part, which is just as important and, and which players generally don't understand when I talk to them, just as important to be able to concentrate well is to recognize very quickly when we're no longer concentrating and paying attention to the target. So we've got to recognize as quickly as possible that my mind has wandered, I've been distracted, uh, and then, then return it as quickly as possible onto the target, okay? And so this skill is a very, very simple skill to train. At the, at the end of this session, I'm gonna give you a link where we've already got a video up for you, so you can, you'll be able to go to and, and do a practice activity uh, specifically about developing attentional control. It's a very simple skill to develop. It's incredibly important. It's the basis of how well we compete. And it's simply aim and maintain attention. Notice when our minds wandered and be able to shift back quickly. Our third C, a skill is committed action. This is our C of the PACT method. And so with commit, our committed actions, as I introduced, it's processes that we uh, we want to commit to during points. And so the idea here is that before we play a point in every match, even before we do a rally in practice, we want to make sure we are clear on the process that we are going to commit to that increases the chance of getting what we want out of that point. So it might be winning in a match, right? It could also be to improve our skills in your practice sessions. The more you can go, okay, just this point I'm going to commit to, the better, and we want to be regularly checking in. At the end of rallies and points, we need to regularly check in and go, well, did I actually commit to the process that I said I was going to do? And the key here is when we're choosing our processes that we're going to commit to, we're not, we're not uh, committing to, to literally trying to win the point. It's not about the outcome of the point. It's even not about the, how well we execute our skills because some, day we'll execute, some days we'll execute better than others. But for example, we have four categories of commitments that we talk about at, at, 
uh, at Mentally Tough Tennis, and that's we could commit to uh, something external, right? So we could commit to watching the ball would be a simple example of of committing to um, uh, committing to watching the ball. We could commit to a body, what we call body or racket commitment. So that could be having great body language or having great energy or having great footwork to do with our body or to do with our racket. Often when you're doing your practice sessions, you will be committing to doing something with your racket to try to improve your skills, often the technical skills, right? So you might be working with your coach and they've got a, a key, a cue that they're working on to try to improve your forehand. You, as you go into the new rally, you would be committing to try to do that cue. That would be an example. Third one is game style, obviously very relevant for match play. And I'm sure what Craig really focused on a lot last time. And this is where we're committing to the game style that increases the chance of us doing well. Um, and then the fourth one we call alert autopilot. Alert autopilot is when we're just very present and we're using our senses to react and let our previous training uh, really guide our actions. Okay, and so this fourth one, T, the we call it tolerance. Um, and this is to do with the passengers on the bus. This one I'll spend a little bit more time on because it's so, so important. And so when I ask that question of what stopped you competing well, most often when we discover, or when we're thinking about matches that we didn't compete well, this is the biggest uh, influence. The reason for that is that as we compete, we naturally all get very frequently occurring difficult thoughts and feelings, difficult passengers come on the bus and start making things more difficult from the back of the bus, right? And so th this one is super, super important to get the, the hang of and start to uh, get an understanding of, of what's going on. And so as I said in the bus story, the, the first step to respond well to difficult passengers is for the bus driver to notice and have the awareness that, okay, right now, this my passenger is saying something difficult. As soon as we have awareness, we have a choice in how we're going to respond. In that stage, the bus driver can go, okay, wait a minute, I'm not going to listen to the passenger. I'm going to refocus on the road and I'm going to commit to the action that increases the chance of success. Um, but this is a very, very challenging thing to do because it, at, for us as tennis players, we tend to automatically act based on our unintentional thoughts and feelings that show up as we compete. So it's a very challenging thing to do, but it's a very important thing to do. So as I started to mention, the key, the, the most common passengers, let's just look at the most common passengers that, that we all experience as, as we compete, the nervous pr or pressure passengers or stress passengers. Um, and so the, the uh, picture we've got here was Federer Djokovic. That's the Wimbledon final last year. So you guys might remember in the fifth set, I would say they both got caught up and, and started at some point listening to the difficult, nervous passengers on their bus. For Djokovic, it was serving at 4-2 in the fifth when he double faulted at least once and played a really tentative game. So he might have had passengers saying, don't miss, you're in front, right? You're about to, you're about to win Wimbledon. This is going to be massive. And he got caught up. And then obviously Federer, when he was serving for the match at 8-7 uh, for 40-15, he got nervous passengers on the bus and those nervous passengers, the feelings when we get nervous, you'd be, you would, if you're a player, you would be um, very familiar with the, the butterflies in our stomach, the tighter muscles and so forth. And so it's very easy to get caught up listening to those passengers. The second one, as I mentioned, Freddie frustration, we call this one. Um, and so Freddie's the one that tends to say, you, you know, you should be doing better. That's not good enough. Even that's not fair. If you're getting cheated, that you might be getting a frustration passenger saying that's not fair. In this example I used uh, was Asaka when she actually ended up winning the Australian Open last year. But she had the chance to finish the match at 5-3, I think, in the second set. Lost that, got very frustrated for a few games started driving her bus based on what Freddie Frustration was saying, but did an awesome job of recovering uh, and competing effectively in the third set to then come away and win, win the match. Just have a read of this quote. This one, you guys may not remember David Ferry, even though he's just been gone a little while, just retired. But just read this quote. Okay. And so, so David Ferrer, for those of you who, who don't remember him, was probably uh, 
Yeah, Conrad, what do you reckon? One of the best competitors in the last 20 years? <coughs> Probably yeah. the best competitor not to win a slam in the last yeah. decade. Yes, <laughs> I'd agree with that. He was just such an awesome competitor. If it wasn't for these all-time greats, he would have won Grand Slams. Yeah. And, and this is the great example here is that even he got caught up in this example against Nadal at the French Open, it was, listening to his helpless passengers. I call, these, call it sometimes called hell and helplessness, tends to say things like, there's nothing you can do, it's too hard, there's nothing you can do to solve this problem. And when we get caught up listening to hell and helplessness, we tend to lose our energy and our will to keep competing as, as hard. This final example here, low confidence self-belief passengers, I'm sure you know, we've all experienced these to a degree. And the example here I use is that for a very for quite a while throughout their careers, Nadal tended to beat Federer. And so when Federer went to play Nadal, he would have had low confidence. He would not have had much self-belief, right? But then he turned the tables and he started beating Nadal. And except for on clay, the last three or right. four years, <laughs> he has beaten uh, Nadal nearly, I think, every time. Um, five or six times. So, so now when Federer goes to play Nadal on hard courts, at least or on grass, he would be feeling very confident. He'd have the the expectation. So these are the passengers. These passengers tend to come on the bus at the start of matches and predict what's likely to happen in the match. Okay, um, Doctor Dr. Ross, when you can, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Um, everyone watching today is marvelled by Nick Kyrgios. Okay, the yeah. guy we all know he's. His extreme is out of this world and his other extreme is also doesn't belong in this world. So, mm -hmm. you know, he, he obviously plays a lot and, and gives up, he tanks, he throws. He does all those things that are completely, you know, we do not want to see them as tennis coaches. It's a living nightmare what we, we're watching half the time and this underhand serve and all this sort of stuff. But I've seen something you've spoken about before where it's really a response of almost, I don't care. Um, and and it was interesting what I what I kind of heard you mention earlier. You, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that Nick Kyrgios response of "I don't care"? Yeah, I'll get to that in 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 about three or four slides away. So I'll talk yeah, about Kyrgios specifically for sure, and that's a very very important one. So and we're about to move on to that idea now. So and to just to finish on this, the the key message here for for me is. When we're talking about these different difficult passengers that come on our buses, so the unintentional thoughts and feelings that are showing up as we compete, one of the keys here to competing effectively is actually um, recognizing, and the reason I use these all-time great players is that everyone gets them. That's just that we all know that it's normal to experience these difficult unintentional thoughts and feelings. Um, and to a degree, they are determined what we feel and think is determined on the based on the situation we're in. So this is this better uh, Nadal example. Um, it's a situation we're in, but also our history within similar situations. So if I've lost to someone five times in a row, I probably am going to get a difficult passenger saying you're probably going to lose this time. All right. And so um, when we're talking about the key to responding well, we we're not necessarily talking about, okay, I've got to try to control or stop having these difficult thoughts and feelings. Like in the bus story, one of the key skills is actually um, being able to just simply respond better to them. We want to develop choice and being able to notice, okay, there is the difficult thought, but now I'm going to shift my attention onto the helpful thing that increases the chance of success and commit to an action that helps. And the, the, the key here with this self-awareness move is that um, we don't necessarily need to get rid of the difficult thoughts and feelings to be able to commit to the action that we want. And this is the skill, the key skills that we want to develop. And now I'm going to move on to what Conrad was talking about. The, the, as well as having our self-awareness of noticing, okay, right now I've got a difficult thought. Right now I've got a difficult feeling. The second part of this is that it's obviously we don't like having diff these difficult thoughts and feelings, right? We'd rather not have them. And so often what happens with... Uh, players who aren't mentally tough is they develop habits where they start to automatically without realizing kick the make all their efforts about getting rid of the difficult passengers often the the nerves and the fear of losing that we talk about now this is a bit more of a challenging topic to 
wrap our heads around, but it's an important one we start to think about at least uh, and develop more understanding over time. And so with tolerance, the idea here is rather than trying to control these emotions, so rather than getting in the back of the bus and trying to get rid of the difficult passengers, we actually want to develop what I would call our emotional fitness. Uh, it's like physical fitness training in a way where we want to actually get fitter at being able to have these difficult thoughts and feelings on the bus, but still be able to, as the bus driver, remain in our seat, keep our attention on the road, keep committing to the helpful actions, um, even while we've got them on the on the bus. So we might call this acceptance as well. So we don't have the, the Hinescu example, but these are the different, different uh, examples that I'd like you to think about that may relate to you in some way, because for some of, for most of us, all of the, we do all of this, this stuff uh, at some point. So Andy Murray, when he um, once again, hopefully comes back and starts playing uh, awesome singles again, but one habit he had when he wasn't playing his best and under a lot of pressure, when he was feeling a lot of pressure was to yell at his coaching team. And what happens with in with this one for some players is that when we get when we act very angrily it actually reduces the amount of nerves and fear that we feel so we when we act when we're very angry we don't feel nervousness and fear at the same time and so in this case murray got into the habit like an addiction of getting angry to reduce his own stress but um, when we think of the bus story unfortunately this doesn't help it wouldn't have helped him play his best because it's like getting in the back of the bus and then where all our efforts are trying to kick off the nerves and get rid of them through anger instead of staying in the front of the bus. So that's an example of, of this in anger. Now, excuse making is a really big one. Excuse making is when we sort of blame out other things then other than ourselves to um, as the cause of us not playing well or things not going how we want. And in the same way, this example of Serena, you know, I would say when she lost the US Open final um, to Osaka, right, in uh, yeah. 2018, yeah, when yeah. she sort of lost the plot, in some ways she may have had some difficult things happen to her, but it's easy for us to then use those and sort of uh, make use them to be excuses where we lose the idea of what we're out there to do, which is to try to win the match and improve, right? And so... So in that case, I would say to some degree, Serena got caught up, even the one of the, the maybe the best female player of all time, got caught up in excuses to reduce her own stress because she had passengers on the bus saying, I'm about to lose this incredible opportunity to win the US Open and win, to become, was it tie the all-time Grand Slam um, record? So she had huge stress and pressure and excuses can, re can reduce that without us understanding. And yeah. here, uh, Conrad is the, is the curiosity example. So this is a huge one, it's very common that we tend to do this. And I would say for Kyrgios, when we reduce our effort level, it reduces the fear, it reduces the stress of the moment. And so the you might call these addictions, they sort of mm -hmm. work the same way as being addicted. And what can happen is our brain is always searching for ways to reduce fear because fear and anxiety is the thing that we, we least like having. And so in this case, if we think of the bus story, I would say, and Kyrgios sort of is a good example because he does all of this stuff that we're talking about. He, when we're seeing him not try as hard, get angry, make excuses, lose concentration, play fancy shots, I, I would say that in some part that is an, a habit that he has accidentally developed over time where, where he's doing all these things, it's successfully kicking his fear of losing and perhaps the pain of losing off the bus but it's costing him the chance to compete effectively because um, because he's in the back of the bus trying to get rid of the fear and so forth. You know, I happen to know, um, I, I know, I saw, saw quite a bit of Kyrgios when he was when he was young. I know his coach, I actually work with uh, his junior coach now at the Tennis Australia Canberra Academy and so we've talked a lot about him and, and um, and this almost certainly is the case for Kyrgios. And, and because he was actually a very good competitor when he was young. And when he first came on the tour, like when he was 18 or 19, he competed really, really effectively. But probably the pressure and stress has sort of added up to create this habit. And once we create the habit of getting rid of the difficult passengers, it, it can be very hard to stop. Dr. Ross, can I jump in with a question about Nick as well, though? Because you yeah. say getting rid of the fear, but he... 
I, I mean, he plays much better against the top players than against, you know, lower yeah. level players uh, for yeah. the most part. So you would assume that like, you know, if, if, if most, most players go up against, uh, you know, Novak and Rafa and those guys, they fold, he goes up against them. He plays better. So I don't know. That just, it seems like a little bit of a paradox, but maybe, maybe yeah. you have some thoughts there. Yes, I, I definitely do. It's, and that is a great question. What, what tends to happen is when we play better players that we uh, are better than us, uh, like on, if we have like a pecking order, we actually feel less pressure and less, it's less stressful because we don't have the pressure of if we lose to them, it's not like we lose our place on the pecking order. So it's not as, it's not as pres- pressured. When we play players, if I'm here and I'm playing a player who I think, you know what, uh, I should beat this person. So I'm, co- I'm sort of confident, but I'm also worried about I could possibly lose. I'm going to feel more pressure. And so the reason, reason Kyrgios plays better against the top guys is that because he doesn't have as much pressure to win as he does when he plays players less, uh, not as good as him, he would feel less pressure. And therefore, it's likely these addictions don't come into play um, as much. He doesn't, his brain doesn't go to these methods because he's not feeling as much fear of losing, basically. Dr. Roth, I need to ask a question right there, which relates back to um, player development which is what we're interested in and obviously parents are interested in. I run a very large UTR league and we run a lot of competitions. And probably for us as coaches, one of the difficult uh, questions we're confronted with regularly is I want my child to play someone who's up better than them. I want them to play, you know, consistently someone who's one or two UTR points ahead of them. We, from uh, research of matches that we've conducted, we know, actually it's statistical, that the winning rate of playing up is around 15%. So that means the, the upper dog wins. And so although we're chasing the better player and trying to play them, in terms of developing these mental skills, it's arguably better to play players the same or slightly lower than you. Would that be right to say? I, I mean, generally speaking, uh, Conrad, I would suggest a, a good mix, a good mix, okay? Because because if I'm playing uh, someone better than me, I'm going to have to learn to respond better to perhaps having the low confidence or the lack of self-belief, but I'd also feel less pressure. But in that other scenario, yes, if I'm playing someone who I'm expected to be, it's, a, it's an incredibly important thing to, to develop this ability to... Um, to play well and compete effectively when I'm feeling more pressure, which will happen when I'm playing playing someone who has uh, not as good of previous results as me. And this is, it's a natural thing because we don't like feeling the pressure and the stress and the fear of a scenario where, where in, in the case of parents, that my child's playing someone who they could lose to and they lose their place in the pecking order. We've got this sort of brain that that doesn't doesn't like that. Then the natural inclination is is, in this scenario is, is without realizing we can try to avoid that those situations right but it's an absolute necessity i, I would i would say obviously i'm a, i'm a sports like but but i got i was a coach originally i only got into this field because i i found that it was the to me the most important thing of all in terms of development and the and i would argue that the ability to respond well to the fear of failure and pressure uh, through exposing ourselves to having more of those experiences through playing lots of matches, particularly putting ourselves in pressure situations, that getting the difficult feelings that we don't like having and learning to respond well to those passengers is, in my opinion, the most important skill of all, including technical and physical skills, because it's, it's as we can see, even with these top players, they're dealing with the same stuff. We could use lots of examples. We could use Novak in the Aussie Open final where he said, you know, for a set or two, he sort of lost his way and, and got caught up. He actually said, I got caught up in the stress. I feel stressed like everyone. I get nervous about what's going to happen. And he said his actual physical sort of meltdown, he, he said, I think that was partly emotional, getting caught up in the stress of the, the final. So, yeah, absolutely. The, the idea of playing players where you want it, you feel pressure and you get these ugly, difficult feelings, it's, it's key to practice those and learn to respond the key, the ways to respond well to them. 
would you say before you start getting uh, back into the uh, presentation? Would you, is there is Novak the top, the the mentally toughest player on tour right now, or is or is or is there is there one or two that pop out in, in your mind? I mean, I can you know I can tell like I watched you know when he played team in the Aussie Open finals, and you could just tell that there was just you know team was more talented that day, but he was just tougher. Yeah, I mean Novak now is oh. incredible. I mean, I, I would if I had to name one, I would name Novak, and I. I really think the way he's going and the way he's developed his mental skill, obviously his tactical skill, um, and he's and he's he's physically he's unbelievable. So he's got all these four components in place, and and personally, I think it's going to be, uh, I, I I think he could end up winning the most slams by quite a margin as long as he stays healthy. Well, he's three he, years younger than yeah these guys. Yeah, he's so well placed uh, mentally now, which was really the biggest barrier to him early in his career because he he had these habits as well right he early in his career used a lot of excuses he often sort of he got into the tanking sort of stuff um mm. and now while, while he as he said even even now he still has challenges in matches like he said in the, our video and and the key there is like he said he doesn't see it as trying to control these emotions anymore he sees it as channeling and responding well to and 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 that's the, the key skill that um he's developed to, uh, uh, yeah, unbelievable. But in saying that, Nadal is an absolute <laughs> mental giant as well. I mean, he's he's he, he's right up there. And Federer, although he doesn't get the credit, the, the fact is he's won more big matches than anyone ever. So, and and same on Serena, Serena's side. Serena, um, you know, although she's had some troubles recently in the finals, probably to do with what we're talking about here, because of the huge pressure and stress she's feeling, around trying to get to this all-time Grand Slam record. And now the thing is she's had some, while, while say, three or four years ago, she had an incredible record in Grand Slam finals. It was something like 20 and 6 or 22 and 6. So she'd almost always won. Now that she's lost a few finals in a row, with what I'm talking about here, she will naturally not have that confidence anymore when she comes into these huge matches. As well as having the stress, it's a very, very big barrier for her now to overcome to... Um, that she that makes things more difficult. She's going to have more difficult passengers in the back of the bus yelling louder when she gets to the final, the end of Grand Slams. Um, right. Yeah, but she's she's been amazing. Serena's been amazing. If I can ask you one that I think is relevant, I've noticed it come up a few times here in the questions. Um, a lot of kids, particularly, get defensive as a first means of nerves. So. Um, you know, you hear all the time, swing out, swing for the fences, stay loose, breathe, take your time, you know, let it go, all these different things. But it is natural and it is unavoidable for many players to feel defensive. So then you'll see, obviously, you know, a great forehand become a chip forehand or a good two-hand, solid two-hand backhand become a slice um, for fear of missing or whatever it might be. If you're in that boat, what do you recommend a player could do? Are there any activities or, you know, what is the best thing for, the, for them to do in that situation when they fall into defensive ways? Yes, great question. I would agree. It's probably the most common challenge that we all that we all face. And and getting back to that, even the, even the best players um, do it as well. So the key here is that let's imagine it as the bus story, and this is an example of how we could use the bus story, is what's happening is we're there, we're trying to perhaps finish the, the close match. Annie Anxious comes on the bus and starts advising from the back of the bus. We get a thought, at some point we get a thought saying, okay, just make it and maybe they'll miss. As well, we've got the tighter body, right? So the key skill here is this, this idea of awareness is that we need to practice trying to start to imagine or think of our, the thoughts as passengers on the bus and we need to t keep checking in. As soon as we realize, okay, wait a minute, I just played a tentative point. I just played a tight point. In the way that I work, I call it the ABC routine. C is we commit to the helpful process. A at the end of the points is ask the key question, did I commit? And then B between points is be present. And so as soon as when I go ask, when I'm checking in and go, wait a minute, I'm not committing to the helpful game style. Between points, we need to become present. And one way we can become present is check in, right? And go, okay, wait, what are the passengers on the bus saying? And so at that point, Annie Anxious is saying, just make it, just get it in. Maybe they'll miss. Don't mess it up from here. 
you and might be predicting losing, right? And so then as soon as we know, we've got to notice to have any choice to make a different decision and how we play that point uh, than listening to what Annie Anxious is advising, we need to notice what, what, what the thought is, just make it. And as soon as I notice that, I can then, I want to practice getting connecting back to my purpose. And so perhaps my purpose is I want to become a better player. I want to improve my ability. And, but the key here is then get back to committing to the game style that I, that I want to play that's going to help me improve as a player and increase the chance of success. And so the key, key move is if I can notice that thought as a passenger on the bus who's advising me poorly, I can recognize that and then I'm going to shift back and go, okay, no, I'm not, basically I'm not going to listen to any anxious. I am going to commit to the process that's going to help me improve as a player. That's the real the key move. Without that, we'll automatically listen to, to any anxious. So this idea of thinking of the our thoughts and feelings as passengers on the bus and practice noticing what are they saying right now is an incredible activity that we should be practicing all the time, you know, because because they come up so often. They're so common. Um, let's see, we'll keep we'll do a couple more questions. There's a there's a ton, but we'll probably keep this um we'll keep a couple more questions going here. I have well, one really good one from the gallery that's a lot of um, our kids, when they play, they'll look up at their, you know, their parents or their coach, usually their parents who are watching the match, you know, maybe every couple of points, obviously at the pro level, these guys are always looking up to the coach's box. You don't really see that in other sports. Is that like, I mean, is that something you recommend? Should they, you know, what's, you know, kind of what's, I don't know, what's, what's, what's that about? They're always like pumping their fists. Like you don't really see that in baseball. You don't see pitchers looking at their managers or quarterbacks yeah. looking at their coaches. It's kind of, so is yeah. there something going on there? I think that makes it a tennis only uh, activity. Yeah, I think it's well, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's probably got something to do with the individual nature of tennis. So you're sort of out there on your own. Yeah. And it is, that in itself makes it more challenging competitively, right? Is that we're out there on our, our own. Right. We are, and they were probably looking for, you know, support and so forth. So I think generally speaking, my, my general advice is that, you know, we want to, we basically, we don't want to, Get in the habit like Murray, right? Where we're, we're sort of um, using uh, parents and coaches as ways to blame to reduce our own stress. We want to practice the ability to handle that stress um, our, ourselves, and and uh, and so forth. Um, but looking to, in the same way, you know, looking to our box if, uh, as professional players, or you know, looking to our parents and whatnot. I don't, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing to go and look for some support during the yeah. during the time. Um, so I think the main thing there is how we how we are interacting. Are we interacting with our people who are supporting us in a way that um, connects us back to something helpful that we can do, or are we, um, you know, if we're looking at our, our parents and coaches and and basically um, blaming and so forth then what we want to practice is recognizing why is that happening and it's likely that we're trying to put the stress outside ourselves and we're in the back of the bus trying to reduce the stress when what we need to do at that time is maybe look quickly for some support and encouragement but then come back to that place of starting to um, uh, practice noticing and and doing i'll give you a quick activity to do with the uh to do with the difficult feelings right so we've just mm -hmm. noticed the, the ones with thoughts um, and an extension to what I was just talking about in terms of responding to anxious thoughts, I call it thanking the passengers. So we might, might not only notice them, but in, we might actually uh, go to the extension of silently saying, you know, thanks, thanks Freddie frustration or thanks Annie for your comments. Because as soon as we do that, we've really got to that place of acceptance and so forth. Um, but to do with difficult feelings, right? So with, uh, with, really nerves is a great one. So if we're feeling a lot of stress and a lot of nerves, we're gonna feel it in our body. And so the idea here is, is when we're doing our physical fitness training, as just going running, for example, we go for a run, we get fitter. But part of that process means we're also getting fitter and, and more used to having the physical discomfort. So as we do running, we'll get fitter, not only because our body's getting fitter, but we're also building our tolerance to the physical discomfort. And so when we're running, a great activity to even practice our mental fitness is to notice when we start feeling physical discomfort and practice being more open to that and even notice the passengers on the bus that are telling us to slow down. 
and see if we can just keep running for a little longer and tolerate that the, the physical discomfort. Now, when it comes to our emotional discomfort as we compete, I call this activity notice look, and it works exactly the same way. When we feel start to feel really nervous, instead of trying to say take a breath to reduce the nerves, what I encourage, I want my players to get fitter at having the nerves. And so I this notice look is we find where we notice the physical sensations of nerves in our body and we practice it observing it for five to ten seconds where we just notice the nerves and we we try to be curious about it. So we try to get this observe it and really look deeply and go, where do I feel that most most uh, notably and really observe it like one way to think about it it's a bit weird but is think about like we're a curious scientist and we're trying to learn more about the sensations of nerves when they're there and as soon as we do this quick notice look activity we are we obviously become aware right so that's going to give us a choice in how we respond but we're also we're developing our fitness in having it if I'm observing the feeling without getting rid of it I'm developing my fitness in being able to have that feeling, and that's what we want to develop over time. Dr. Ross, um, I was uh, at a conference recently presenting down in Hilton Head Island and was listening to the great Jim Lair, who I'm sure you know is an unbelievable yeah. mental coach with just so much experience. And without going into detail, he spoke about two absolutely critical things that I was a massive takeaway for me. I wanted your take on it. The first one was the power of imagery. So seeing things and how that codes the mind a lot faster than visual feedback. So the power of kids watching videos, watching positivity in action, watching athletes, you know, get through difficult moments and, and respond with fist pumps and with whatever things that are positive. That was first. The second one was obviously the inner voice and being able to retrain that inner voice because the person you're going to hear most in your life is going to be yourself. It's your own voice, the internal voice, and that that can be trained very, very well with daily journalizing, handwriting, and committing your words to paper through hand it will anchor in and becomes a recoding of the brain. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so first, well, with visualization generally as a skill, I think it's it's awesome. So when we get to, to let you guys know, we're gonna give you a link. There's one video up already and there's gonna be a four day video series from me. The first day is an attention strength training. The second day, I'll, I'll introduce you guys to visualization. So visualization generally as an like imagining and remembering events and so forth is an incredibly, it's a powerful thing that we can do. Um, so we can use it for all sorts of different ways. So this is very relevant for being off court at the moment. So with visualization, we can improve our skill, our physical skills through visualizing because it activates the neurology in our body and actually changes our physical responses in a, in a sort of a tiny way as compared to doing the, um, doing the actual physical skill. So you guys can practice uh, be practicing off-court visualizing. We prepare for matches through visualization. So Andre Iscu, Bianca Andre has talked a lot about how she does visualizations 15 minutes a day. She visualized before the match seeing success and seeing herself compete well before she won the US Open. Djokovic talked about doing it before the Wimbledon final. We can develop confidence through visualization by remembering good past experiences, okay? Um, we can even heal, help heal injuries through visualization. So it's Visualization is awesome. And as you say, even watching successful uh, performances, sec watching what pros do, it's all a great way to, to work. The, the second one, what I would stress with the, the idea that we can over time retrain or shift and uh, shape our natural internal thoughts and feelings is, is what I was talking about today to me is a first core step that we often miss. And that is, um, a recognition that that first of all, we still, no matter how much we do that, no matter how well we train our brain, we it's a key core foundation that we are still going to have lots of difficult thoughts as we compete. And as I tried to point out, that that's a key foundation that I think generally in sports psychology we haven't done a good job of helping people recognize, normalizing that even if I am the most positive. Uh, well-trained mind, 
I am still going to feel lots of nerves, lots of stress, lots of frustration. I'm going to have lots of difficult thoughts. But so that's the first point. Then what what Dr. Lowe was talking about is, yes, absolutely. Over time, if by 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 practice, training, um, even visualization, but all sorts of things, journaling is a great idea, focusing on the positives and so forth, we can tend to we can influence the type of passengers that come on our bus as we compete. Right. Which is great. The thing I would say for parents who are watching is the biggest influence on what sort of, of what Dr. Lur is talking about, how players come to automatically uh, perceive and experience competition. The biggest influence is parent communications. So I did my PhD with Tennis Australia uh, with parents. So we did three years. I interviewed Grand Slam winners, coaches, parents of players, who had won slams, who had given up early, who were terrible competitors. I spoke to, a, 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 I was lucky enough to speak to a father and, and he was a week from passing away and he, uh, he was terminally ill and he thought this was so important that he talked to me during my PhD about the mistakes he thought he made. And so ultimately, I did my PhD. We did a parent, an eight-week parent program and without ever meeting the kids, I never talked to the kids, but simply uh, working with parents, we were able to show that that players' competitive responses change in in a good way. They competed more effectively purely through sh uh, helping parents improve their their uh, communications. And that and how that works is what you're talking about through parent communications. That has a p very very powerful shaping in how players come to automatically think and see see stuff. So, and, and, and we've got to remember this as coaches as well, right? That as parents and coaches, we have a huge influence on the, the, the way that we come to automatically, players come to automatically think and, and feel out there on the court. That's amazing. Look, um, Doctor, I think we want to try to probably wrap it up fairly soon. I know you, yeah. you're a busy man, but before we do, um, <clears throat> we're really excited at Centre Court to offer um, a special mental uh, development program over the next 28 days. You've been good enough to put something together for us, for our players uh, and, I guess, parents to go through the journey with the players. Do you want to elaborate uh, with us how that's going to work? Okay. So what I've done, I've just put up a link in the chat. So hopefully you guys can see that. Can we see that? Yep. Yeah, okay. Sure. So this is for, for you guys watching. This is the free vid page there's already one up there so i introduced first attention strength training um they're five to six minutes they're going to happen over four days so there's one there already i'll be reducing i'll be putting out the visualization one next then we're going to do the emotional fitness activity and then we're going to talk about committed actions um so this is your free your center court free video series link so you can go in there each day just check this link and you'll see that so that's there then i'm thinking conrad we might about friday right we uh, to let you guys know on next monday we're going to start the center court um 28 day mental fitness challenge and so what this is going to be based on it's a, it's it's designed to be done off court it's it's actually based on the very program i did with north carolina men's tennis this year we we at the time we called it 20 minutes for 20 days challenge and um so north carolina team this year i think they increased their singles win percentage by 25 percent and that they, they were a very, very big chance to win the NCAA, uh, NCAA title um, when things stop. So they'd won 90% of their matches. So they did this program. I've extended it slightly. So it'll be about, on average, it'll be 15 minutes over 28 days. I'm going to be coming on each day. I'll let you know when the activity has been released, the challenge been, has been released, and then we'll, um, and then you'll go in and you'll be able to do the activity each day. So we'll, but on Friday, Conrad, oh, we'll, we'll release the details on about Friday and then registration will go until Sunday and we'll start on Monday, okay? But for now, you can, if you guys go in, you'll have the free video link uh, to give you guys the idea of some activities you can start doing off court already and then we'll release details. I, I suspect Friday um, you can start registering for the 28-day uh, mental fitness off court challenge that will we'll start on Monday. And how can they track progress or how they're doing? How, how can how can uh, everybody listening or listening and uh, track yeah, track their progress in terms of tracking progress of 
Uh, in terms of the challenge, like how do they know if, if they're doing well? Is it or you yeah, know, I mean, uh, what we're gonna, as part of that, the big challenge is we're going to have a um, uh, a leaderboard. So a few, mm -hmm. a, a couple of uh, little bonuses we'll include, which we'll let you guys know about. The first one is going to I'm going to include a, a quick course, so you can go in and you can you'll uh, we've got a little we put it together a little quiz, and you will be able to choose what you think is your biggest mental toughness challenge. And then you'll get you, you'll get six strategies basically. So you can get free access to this the course. It's usually ninety seven bucks to do with the the the, the progressing uh, challenge. We're going to have a leaderboard, and we're going to see who uh, completes the most challenges. Okay, and so and at the end of that, we'll talk to you. But we're going to let um, you. We're going to have a little prize for whoever completes the most activities and, and challenges throughout the twenty eight days of the main of the main program. That's cool. Yeah, we'll send this out to all of our junior players, so we'll get a nice little competition going. That's uh, that's awesome. And uh, and for everybody that competes, maybe we'll give them a little. Uh, not that the club is open right now, but when it opens, we'll give them a little prize as well. That's that's great. Yeah. So just to um to conclude, uh, Dr. Anthony Ross, that's absolutely awesome information. You can see that we could go for another five hours. I think. Um, I hope everyone really gets involved in this twenty-eight day center court challenge um just for everyone to know dr ross and i are talking about how we're going to be able to include some uh mental specific training into our summer camps uh for performance through summer and then as a regular ongoing addition into our performance programs um from fall on after summer so we'll let you know more about that as it unfolds in the meantime, I just want to take one minute, if I can, to remind everyone, you may have got an email today about a very exciting brand new program that we've released, which is called Centre Court 360. It is basically a high school initiative with a goal of developing and supporting a holistic student athlete, um, focusing on those kids who are needing a little bit more support in the academic side whether it be, you know, specific subjects through tutors, through small group um, study sessions, uh, whether it be college prep, essay prep, SAT prep, whether it be nutrition, mental uh, recruitment, you know, college admissions. The Centre Court 360 program uh, tomorrow night at 7.30, we'll be having the first online webinar through Zoom. Um, if you're interested, please email 360 at centercourtclub.com. Um, it's really a fantastic initiative, again, as I said, to help uh, athletes in the off-court side and to become better students. And obviously, we're going to have specialized topics such as, you know, um, to stress tolerance, mental toughness, developing leadership skills, mindfulness, um, you know, how to use technology better and generally helping your efforts. Everyone's putting in a lot of efforts with their sport and their training. We wanted to bring the other side also to Centre Court. So the Centre Court 360 project, we have some of the best speakers from some of the best schools, colleges around that are all involved. Uh, it's very exciting. So uh, hopefully you all can come on tomorrow night and uh, have a look at 7.30. Um, join us in that. Uh, it's a Zoom meeting. So join us in that and uh, that'd be great. But in the meantime, Dr. Ross, absolute sensation, mate. Thank you very much for putting up your time. I'm not sure everyone understands. Over in Australia right now, it's probably 6 a.m. Uh, or something like that. So, uh, mate, hope everything goes well over there. <laughs> stay uh, healthy, stay safe, and um, we'll be we'll be speaking closely in these coming days. Okay. I, think, um, I think I wanted to also thank you as well. I think maybe what, what we can do is because we nearly all the questions and there were tons of great questions maybe if, if dr ross is nice enough to come back out we could have people submit questions beforehand and we could just send them over to you and then do that kind of talk next time but um but yeah i second that, that, um that's it this was amazing yeah i i would love to do that if you just get if you gather the, the questions and we put them together and then we can just go through the, the main questions that everyone asked and that would be awesome i uh, appreciate you, uh, the opportunity great to speak to the centre court community, and um, just from my end, you know, I've been, as Conrad said, I've been, we've been talking about the, the mental fitness side of things for several months, and and to have um, it be part of an academy that's so dedicated to the holistic development for you guys is a, is a huge thing because I know that's not always the case. So you're very 
from my perspective at least, you're very lucky to be involved with such a professional and caring um, uh, uh, professionals uh, within Centre Court. So, um, yeah, it's awesome to be part of it. Thanks a lot, uh, Anthony. Right. All right, we're going to sign off. Thanks again for everybody. We'll have some more talks next week and beyond. And uh, stay safe, everyone. We'll see you Thank guys. You. Bye bye.